from Genua, which is also a sponsor here of the conference. And <laughs> <laughs> and we, we produce firewall products and VPN gateways based on OpenBSD. And my talk will be the, about all the security mitigations we have in uh, OpenBSD. That's also one of the reasons why I have chosen uh, OpenBSD as a base for our products. And um, <coughs> so I'll give, I'm, I'm trying to give an overview so what we have done the past 20 years or 30 years of OpenBSD security mitigations. So I have to see it in my own slides. <coughs> okay, so um, let's start with the stack overflow. That's the, the, the very basic security problem you have. It's very old, it's very easy to use. And that's the order when we added mitigations to it. So we started in year 2000. We added a random gap at the beginning of the stack so that it's not always at the same location. It's just within one page, a few bits of randomness, and first thing. Then the next thing is non-executable stacks. That's more or less standard nowadays. Um, <coughs> but there already it started to have some user land fallout that needed executable stack for some reason at some time. Next thing is stack protector. That's more or less a compiler features that add some cookies on the, on the stack and when you return from it and you see that the return address has changed, it will, f it will fail by jumping into a terminate function. This was replaced later by Mortimer by RedGuard. RedGuard um, is a little bit different because we in, in the stack protector we only have one random value that's for all functions and if you find out which is th th this value then um, you can make your exploit in the way that you um, that you fake the, 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 the cookie on the stack and you know it and then you, you can do it anyway. With a red card we have a full page of random values and it's harder to guess which function is using which value. And there's another thing, the, the way it's written, we also protect against uh, ROP attacks because with ROP attacks you need some instruction and then re a return and with combining those instructions you find as gadgets in all the program. You can make a Turing complete program by just using some assembly instructions and then the return instruction. And by, by adding some, but by checking the stack pointer and oring it with, with, some, with some secret uh, and then creating a cookie, it's harder to, to, to use that because then you need, you have to know the cookie and you have to know the lo location to, to make um, an, an overflow, buffer overflow that already contains the right value so that it continues. And what was, so th then the, the immutable thing, that's rather new, um, there's the mProtect system call where you can change protections of a page. That means if the attacker can somehow call this mProtect system call, it changes the protection and then it can, do a, a, it can lo upload any exploit. So immutable is a, a one-way call from the process to the kernel. Some things are done by the kernel themselves that prevents that you can ever change a mapping. So when you, the, the, the stack is, for example, is uh, non-executable and if you'd say, okay, mProtect, I want to execute it, this mProtect will fail. Um, and you can also not map something else on top of it. That we've all seen. Uh, you take an M map and map it on top of the stack, and then you don't see the non-executable stack, but have a new one that also is prevented by the system call. And uh, unmap also doesn't work. And the, 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 the last thing is something that uh, Katanis added quite recently. That means that we on not only have this random gap at the beginning of the stack, but we move the stack on 64 architectures um, by whole pages. So here I've um, made it again, uh, made a little picture of that. So this is um, the the random moving of the stack. The, the advantage is that you can have 24 bits, and we need we use one fourth of the available address space on architectures where we can easily implement it. So it's not available for 32-bit architectures but we have it on ARM and on AMD64. So the, the, the gap there is to make all the stacks uh, not have the same alignment all the time. It's, it's just moving around by 
So, so you need to have uh, alignment requirements, I guess, but you can just move the stack by by some bytes, but you have less uh, less randomness. So, so I guess it's not 12 bits because you have some re alignment requirements. It's perhaps 10 bits there. And those uh, s uh, stack guard and uh, red guard things that are cookies that you put there where you have the, the return addresses. And when your buffer overflow overrides them, um, the code detects that and jumps into a terminate termination. So the other thing that the attacker wants to attack is the, the heap of your program. So that's basically what malloc is, is um, working on. And I recommend the talk from, from Otto yesterday where he's going more into deta details into that. So we have guard pages that separate um, allocations we, um, within one page, we have a random order of the chunks so that you don't know where you end up. You also find bugs because when you are at the end of the page and have an overflow, then you, then you run into the, the gap and it is killed. We have uh, canaries, which means that um, in the place, so if you, you allocate, for example, 12 bytes with malloc and the minimum size is 16 bytes, then we have four bytes left and in, in those bytes, uh, a canary is, is written some, some, some ra uh, random value, and if you override it and you free it, then the free these oh, the canary has been changed, that shouldn't happen. Um, and we also use the mprotect and mimmutable system calls to, to protect the, the metadata. So something that menu, uh, malloc only needs after initializes once and one don't wants to change anymore, we immutable it. And we can use mprotect to uh, make pages temporarily not changeable. Malloc has more features. It provides a use after free detection. <coughs> so you can um, do several things. You can unmap all the things that you are. You, you, so malloc frees, the, the, the program frees it in malloc chunks of the page when the whole page is not used anymore, malloc has the option to, to give it back to the kernel. And, and when you do that, and if an attacker wants to use that or you have a use after free, then your program will crash. You cannot do it always because then uh, the performance is, is uh, degraded. But we have clever mechanisms to do it when it's necessary to find bugs. Then um, there's the uninitialized value problem, so when you malloc a page, there's something in there from your previous allocation. If it was previous allocated, otherwise it's zero. When you set some malloc options, then it's filled with some junk, and when you have programs that use these uninitialized values and assume it's zero, they will crash or do something stupid during the test runs. Another thing is that you put in junk after free, so if you have a read after free, then you will not read the value that's supposed to be there, so, but some junk, and then the program will do some crazy stuff and crash, hopefully, so you, that you see the problems during the development phase. We are also um, adapting our, our things. We had this uh, SSH bug where we had a use after free between June previous year and February this year, and um, there we had some page reuses or chunk reuses in, in, in malloc that gave you a chance of one in 32 tries that allowed some research group to um, modify the instruction pointer. And what Otto did then, at the beginning of this release, there were four commits or five commits all in malloc to make that more unlikely to work. So we don't have this, this strict reusing of chunks and um, it's, it's harder for the attacker to get this one to 32 chance. So now it's much better for us and worse for the attacker. So we, we lim limited the chunk reuse because we, we learn from things that happened and say, okay, we can do better. And we always try to be better. So now I'm a little bit going into the return-oriented program, programming. So what do we, um, that's the thing where you have this, um, you just have a, a bunch of pointers, 
and run into a return instruction. Then it takes this pointer from the stack. So you have the attacker writes the pointer on the stack. Then you jump into some, some gadget, run it. Then you, there's the next return, point, return instruction. It takes it from the stack, runs another gadget, takes a return pointer from the stack. And by, by using all the instructions from the get, gadgets, you can write your own programs without writing any code into the program space because it's already there. It's just mixing exi existing assembly instructions. So what we did, we have, uh, we now we mark what, what is stack and what is not stack. So, and, and when you, um, when the stack pointer points to a, a page that's not marked as stack, the kernel terminates the program. That means when you do return your oriented programming, you have to put your um, pointers on the stack. If you put it in the heap and tell somehow the stack pointer, oh, go to there, the kernel will figure that out and, and kill you. It's an opportunistic thing. The processor has no way to do that. But every time you make a system call or the kernel traps, you go to kernel land, this is checked. That's quite easy um, to see where the stack pointer is. And if it's not in, a, in an area that's supposed to be a stack, then the program will stop. We have the, the red guard from Mortimer. I already explained it. Um, so there's one thing. Intel is a, is a very nasty architecture. N usually you have um, aligned instructions, so it's clear what is the return and what not. In Intel, the return has the opcode um, C3, but C3 can be in any other instructions if you interpret it in a different way. So you have, for example, an 11-byte instruction. The fourth byte is a C3 for some reasons, and if you manage to get control over your instruction point and jump trust there, then it will be a return, and that is a gadget, although it was not at the end of a function originally. And uh, you see that if uh, you have a move, befeel, uh, move command, uh, move instruction with the uh, RBX uh, reg register by incident, that's uh, C3 in the, in the opcode. So our C-Lang compiler tries to avoid B, uh, the B re register and takes another one if one is available. So we reduce the number of, ex, uh, of um, gadgets. Another thing is to, to use uh, fork and exec. That means that you rearrange your memory layout and it's harder to guess for the attacker what's, what's there and what not. Uh, so then there's another thing when you have signal handlers the kernel stores the context of where you were before in user land. So you can have a signal handler and then go to the next signal handler and to the next signal handler, and all that context is in user land. And then you call sick return, the signal handler does it at the end, it's a special system call, you can't use it usually from your program. Then these contexts are restored. And that is similar to a return instruction, you can also build drop chains out of that. So we store a random cookie at the end of the, in, in this uh, area where the context of the signal handler is stored by the kernel. And if this cookie, this uh, random value is not the one that the kernel thinks this process should have, it's terminated. So you can't do this uh, sick rob attack. Uh, with long jump and uh, set jump, you have the same problem. You can also build some, some contexts where you can jump around. And there we also have some cookies that must be correct. So it's harder for the attacker to, to build something. Then there, next bullet, there are new instructions. BTI in ARM world and IBT in the Intel world. Uh, I have no idea why the engineers didn't speak to each other and invented those abbreviations. Um, so there in, in Intel you have a, in, in ARM the, the instruction is called BTI, in Intel it's called ENDBR64. And this instruction for old processors that don't support it is an op, does nothing. For new processors, it means that we have, you can set a pit in the CPU that says if you jump to somewhere with an indirect jump, so you load a value in the register and say jump to there, um, and then it has to end at the end burr 64 instruction, and if not, the, 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 you get a trap and the kernel kills the process. That means when you have those 
those um, those gadgets that you usually jump in the middle of func function because you only need the, the final instructions and then the red, it doesn't work anymore. Because when you jump there, it's an, it's an indirect jump, and you're supposed to end at the end br inst uh, instruction. So all the, instruct all the functions that have these features get this instruction in front. Then you tell the CPU, if, um, if, if that's not the case, terminate. And then if the attacker jumps to somewhere else, uh, the, prog uh, it will get a, 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 the kernel will get a trap and, and kill the process. And so the final on po uh, bullet point on this slide is random relinking. To find the gadgets, you have to know where they are. Um, and for example, in libc, it's very attractive. They are the, the system calls. And at every boot, we relink all the objects. And libc is a very good target for that because um, there are a lot of object files. Each libc function has its own object files. Basically, because when you link statically, only this code is, is linked into it and in into your program. And in when you are Using dynamic linking, it means you have a lot of object files and you can make a random order of it and it's very hard to figure out where an actual function is. Even if you have an um, uh, information leak and you, oh, printf is there, you have no idea where scanf is, it's just somewhere else. So then we have some protections from the kernel for user land uh, with uh, mapping. Um, so we have the protect system call. And usually you can say, okay, I want to write, to execute, to read, or um, none, so nothing. What, we, what, what is considered dangerous is having execute and writing simultaneously. That means that you have an exploit code that brings something in your memory and by writing it, and then if you can act, you can jump to that, and then you just write, run your exploit. Um, of course, you can say, okay, we use all our mappings that this cannot happen, but then the attacker may be have an, an, an possibility to run m protect and change your protection. And we enforce that you can never set the write and the execute simultaneously, also for regular programs. So if, if you have some some library imports doing some stuff, and it's trying to do that, the process is killed. Or uh, the process is, uh, the, the, the mProtect fails, that there's a CTL where you can choose that. And then the, the next thing is quite new, it's X only. That means we um, allow execution, but not reading. If the CPU supports it, and few CPUs do, um, if it does not su support it, we do it uh, when we go to the kernel and just check it there. I have an example later. And that means um, that you cannot get information leaks. So when you read the, the, the values by some printf that has a pointer and reads somewhere there, then you read in instructions and, when you, and get that through standard out to your attacker. When he can read your instructions, he can figure out how your memory layout is and say, oh, the libc print function is there. But the process doesn't have to, to know this. It just wants to execute printf, does not want to read the instructions. So when you uh, avoid that anybody can read it, the attacker cannot find out uh, where your stuff is, but you can still run the program. That's the reason why we want that. Then uh, mapping immutable, I already explained that. You can mark some, some regions where you cannot use mprotect, mmap, or M, uh, unmap to, to change it in any way. It's, it's fixed. And we have in mmap two new types. Map stack, I already explained that. When you go to kernel, the stack pointer has to be there in such a segment and that's somewhere else. And map conceal that prevents that you write cord arms to the disk. So if you have to say, okay, here are my crypto keys, and now the program crashes for any reason, you won't have that crypto keys on the disk in the core dump. FreeBSD has a similar option, but it's called differently. I think it's called no core or something. Okay, here I just made a, a picture of the, the things, how, the, how your, your 
how your program address space looks like. You have a, the stack that's readable and writable, not executable and immutable. You cannot change that. Then when you have a, a JIT compiler, there you have usually problems with the, read uh, with the write and the execute. So you have to change the protection when you write the instructions there that you just in time compiled and then you have to make an end protect and then you say, okay, now I have want to execute that. And Firefox added an option for, especially for OpenBSD to allow that. They went for a while also for other operating systems with that, but they figured out that it takes 4% of performance. That's too much for the common Linux user. So on Linux, your Firefox has it mapped simultaneously read writable and executable, and in OpenBSD, not. You have to make a system call to, to, to change between them. <coughs> so the heap is readable and writable and not immutable because it's dynamic. Okay. Then you have ESS, that's the data that is zero initialized when the program starts. So if you have a variable, it's a global variable in your C program, that you don't assign a value, it's zero, and it will end in the ESS segment. And you can re read it, you can write it, but you cannot change that it's readable and writable. You cannot execute it in any way. So data, that's the initialized variables, they are in the, in the program file, and when you start your program, they get into memory. Read-only data, there, if you have a, a, a variable that it's const in your program, it's read-only, and then it will end up there. You cannot change it and only read it. And text, that's your program, you can execute it, and that's it. So hardware X only, I mentioned it. Um, the, the, the question is which protection bits the CPU provides and with ARM and RISC-V. Uh, we have those bits that you can say, okay, we want to execute it but not read it, but in Intel, um, you always can read it, except for newer uh, processes that have a CPU, uh, a, a CPU register where you can say, okay, execute only and, and or not, but that's changeable for user land. But we, in the, in the kernel, enforce it every time you go in the kernel that it's set correctly, and then if you're a new CPU, then y the chances are high that you get that um, in hardware that you cannot uh, execute and read simultaneously. So here's an example of what happens when, um, when you don't have the CPU feature. <coughs> so we map a region, one page, so at, at, uh, at the beginning it's prot non, so you cannot do anything with it. It's anonymous memory, private to you. No file descriptor, that's the minus one. And then we say, okay, we want to read it. We make a print and we read it there, this, this address from there and print it. So that's the first line of the output. So it's zero. We just mapped it, it's zero. And then we say, okay, now we want to execute it. There's no read. And we, we read it and print it and it works. So that's uh, clearly a, uh, a violation, and the, the reason why we can read it, although it's execute only, because I did it on AMD64, and the CPU has no feature to, to detect it. But we can do opportunistic uh, read, X or execute. That means when the page is not mapped. So what you see here, um, the, the first print is missing. So here the page is not mapped. We allocate it, it's not mapped, it's just registered in kernel, there should be memory. <coughs> then we say, okay, we want to read. And say, okay, we want to execute it. And then we do a read, so in the printf. And it's not mapped, so we go to the kernel. And the CPU tells us why we go to the kernel. We go to the kernel because we executed it. We wanted to execute it. And then the kernel says, no, that's wrong. And now he detects the problem and gives us a segmentation call. So even if the CPU doesn't support it, in the kernel we can, when, when we go to the kernel at the right time, we can still check it. And the effort was here to, to get all the, the programs clean that they make the, this decision correctly. Was there a question? This is always on. Uh, you don't see it. 
uh, p perhaps, I don't know, perhaps GDB can do it because it's attached to the program, but you cannot see it from the program itself. So I don't know what GDB does, maybe it can, can do something there, but in, in the kernel we have similar problems. For example, you, you, when, when you have DDB, the kernel debugger, and want to change a variable uh, in, in the kernel, and it's on usually not a writable map, and we change the mapping, change the value, and go back. So there are things that you can work around that. So next thing, I talk about randomness. Um, OpenBSD tries to have cheap random everywhere. So we invented new, new uh, libc functions. That's arc random that gives you a random value and it doesn't block and it's always something random. On other operating systems, if you have something like that, it starts blocking. That means that the, the program flow is not that easy as, as the programmer wishes it to have which means that it's not that likely that he uses it and, and you end up with some get time of day. Um, arc for random uniform, if you want a range of, of random number that's not a power of two, then the correct way to get non bs randomness is, okay, we make, for example, I want numbers between one and 10, and I say, okay, give me a random number, and now it's 12. Then I, then I, I take the random numbers between 10 and 16, which is next power of two. If it's 12, I just throw the thing away and try it again. That's the usual thing. Otherwise, you get bias. Then you just do a divide, you get bias random numbers. And so that we, we added it to the API so that the programmer cannot make this mis mistake. Or, um, then there's srand. That's a very old function to get randomness and it's deterministic. And in OpenBSD, we changed it to be not deterministic. So people that use srand as a crypto randomness source, even on, on OpenBSD, even that is safe. And if you want to have srand for, for example, you have a game and you initialize it, and then you have the same game and can repeat, uh, repeat it, um, then you can use srand deterministic with a seed, and then with the same seed you get the deterministic old srand algorithm. So you have to explicitly enable it to get the cryptographically insecure behavior because there are use cases for the others. So get entropy is a system called to seed the um, arc for random um, um, pseudo random number generator. In libc you have to want to be fast. We want to provide randomness for everywhere. You don't have to think about it, just use it. But when you have to reseed it, you gain the kernel. This system call does not block and this libc calls it whenever it's needed. So when you took too much randomness out of it, the system call is made. When you fork, forking uh, pseudo random number generators is a bad idea because then you have two processes giving you the same numbers, but it always checks the pit, and if the pit changes, um, it calls uh, get entropy to reseed it in, in the child. So we have another thing, you need randomness quite early, especially for the stack cookies of the red guard. So the kernel can provide a process with randomness before it made the first system call. And it works, we have a special elf header that tells the, the loader in the kernel, the exec elf, um, that in this section, in this page, there, there's randomness there should be randomness data. And the compiler just has made all the access to there, if you need that. And when the process accesses, the kernel pre-fills this with random data. So you can start with random data when you start. And we also have the same mechanism in, in, in the kernel. When you boot your system, you also want to have randomness very early. You want to have random physical page layouts and you don't have much entropy collected at that because you have just started your CPUs and they are deterministic. Um, so we have the bootloader has the same mechanism and the kernel also has an OpenBSD randomness page or, or section where the bootloader fills this, so the bootloader loads the kernel, loads etc random seed from the disk, and tells the kernel, there's your random data. So the first instruction the kernel is running, it has, has randomness, and when, you, when, the, when the system comes up, um, then this e etc random seed is, is, is written, and it's also written when the, when the system is rebooted. So while you run, you collect data, you write it in your disk, you boot the kernel, and you have randomness. We make it in user land, we make it in kernel land.
So when we have address space lay uh, layout randomization, we, we uh, map the shared libraries randomly to somewhere. That um, they are also mapped with the MF system call in the end. We have uh, the heap that's using uh, MMAP as a backup, as Otto told you yesterday. We have this stack gap. We have um, pr programs, static, bi the, the, the binary that's movable, so PAE means position independent executable. You have always that for li uh, uh, dynamic libraries, but we also added that for executables, for text, so that you can move that around. And uh, we relink libc. And the newest thing we do is we relink SSHD because SSHD we consider as a, as a high potential target. So every time you put your, your computer, you get a new SSHD with random object files reordered. So we added those in, in, in this order. So we started with one and six is the newest feature. So we, we evolve. We are getting better and better. <laughs> so and that's the, the result of that. So let's, let's start at the top. Stack gap, we move the stack around. We, the heap, it's mapped at random addresses. The heap is not continuously. We, we have guard pages in between that. If we free the heap, we unmap it. So if you have use after free, you will, the, the, the blue thing will, will be gone and you, you get killed. The libraries are loaded randomly. They move up and down. And also the program will move up and down because we made it position independent code. The, the, the disadvantage of position independent code is that you need an extra re register because everything is relative to a register, which is a problem on the i386 because it only has four or six registers. And on, on AMD64, you have more general purpose registers. That's not, not a big problem. And other architectures, architectures have even more registers. So you can look at all this, what I, I was talking about. Um, so I just called the sleep, and then I look at the proc map with it. You see there are start and end addresses of each memory region, and they are random. And you have those flags where you can see how the mapping looks like. You see that we have a lot of things that are Im immutable. We do as much as immutable ourselves. We see that the text is X only and not readable. And uh, read-only data is not writable, and only the heap is not immutable. So what does the kernel exec do? We have a, a bunch of checks there. The first one is, is on this slide because we had a security bug in sudo on Linux. And there the thing, the sudo has the SPIT set. And the bug in sudo was that it was confused if you didn't pass it an, arc, uh, an argument. So the argument count is no zero, which is illegal, but you attack set UID programs with illegal content. And our kernel had this check and would refuse this attack. Linux didn't have it. Then the kernel um, makes a stack randomization. The kernel makes a single cookie key random. Um, if you have some exec pledges, that means that you call, that you say, if I exec something, I want to exec th th these pledges, kernel guarantees that. And for set UID programs, it also reallocates uh, standard in out error to definite zero if it's closed, because by running closed zero, one, two file descriptors, you can do attacks, but not with us. So then the dynamic loader comes, which is responsible for, for getting the, the, the end uh, libraries into the address space. It initializes more random data with get entropy. It fixes the immutable permi permissions because it has to move around stuff. So it's not immutable by the kernel. It's then immutable by the, um, by the dynamic loader. It um, uses MMAP to make some random layout. We have another feature that we um, say system calls are only allowed in this uh, memory region, so that when you have an exploit code, you cannot make a system call from there, except it's the region where it is. The region that where it is is libc. Um, you can only make system calls from libc in OpenBSD, um, and it's immutable. So there's not much to change there. Then the exec system call is considered very 
dangerous because you can go to a completely different process. There we have pin system call, and then you can make the exec only from those 70 bytes where the code actually is. So all system calls have to be in libc. With exec, uh, the exec system call can only be in the few bytes where it is. I think 70 or so. And we have lazy bin binding with kbind. With kbind, you change the the got when you do dynamic linking. You um, you have to connect the the function pointers in your program to the functions in your library. There you have those pointers in the plt and the got, and the um, the uh, the dynamic loader is, is responsible for changing that. Classically, everyone can write there, and you writing to function pointers is not a good idea. Then we start added uh, mprotect, so it's usually protected, but now it's immutable, and you have a special system call where the LDSO can say, okay, we change this this one address here, and it, it says beforehand where what can be changed, and only from LDSO, not from another address, this system call may be called. And we have a special co uh, cookie, a random value in the LDSO that you have to know to execute the system call. So it's very hard to change something there if you're not the right guy who is authorized. Yeah, so the thing is you, you when you do this system call the first time, the kernel remembers where it was called from, and only from that address it's allowed to call it again. So then the pledge is also very famous. There were a lot of talks about it. And the thing about the, the, the main thing about pledge is which restricts that what, what a process can do, that it's easy to use. That means we have a lot of programs that we um, that we pledged. So you, you get this this P in the statistics that says, okay, somebody could call pledge here, and, the, and when you do it in a running OpenBSD system, or at least on my laptop, you have 80, uh, 60, uh, 86% of the process pledged. We have unveil, which hides files from, from the process so that you, that the browser cannot use your private SSH keys on your disk. And there we have 39% unveiled. Unveiled is harder to use and um, Pledge is easier to, to, to implement, and, 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 and uh, I, I, I prefer Pledge because it's, it's a clearer policy and you know what it's doing, and if you do something wrong with Unveil, it's hard to figure out if everything works right because the process just doesn't see a file, and in some error conditions, just something wrong, and you don't see that. Um, so Pledge helps, also helps you to, to structure your design because you know, it's, it's this programmer tool and you have to move the fletch around and your initialization code around to, be, to, to use it easily. What I've implemented in that, um, you get this daily mail. If you enable process accounting on your OpenBSD system, that means if every process dies, you get an, a log entry. It's very useful deb debugging if you don't know what's going on on the machine. And um, with, with LastCom, you see it. And if you have a pledge violation or the process is crashed or you have an unveil in, uh, invali uh, invalidation, then you will see the processes that misbehaved in your daily mail. And you can debug them and fix them. Or see if somebody was attacking your computer. So next thing is, is privilege separation. Um, so the first thing you have to um, when the idea is that you split a user land process and multiple processes, you, def you uh, specify, you fi figure out what is dangerous and has high risk, and then you start with socket pairs to communicate between them, you fork them, you change root them, you s um, change the user ID, you pledge them, you set up some um, iMessage queuing between them, and then you do some file descriptor passing, and then you have split your logic in two processes. And we have done that for a bunch of them. For example, OSPF daemon, we have the part that's calling the, to the route socket in the kernel. We have the part that's communicating with the internet. That should be different. In RelayD, we have uh, several trials that use that to manage the traffic. And also syslogd has a privileged parent which accesses the log files and somebody else who talks to the internet with TLS and something like that. Here we have a slide with fork and exec. 
Usually when you fork, you have two processes that have exactly the same lay layout, but uh, one of the, especially the relay ch childs, that it makes sense to, to exec them yourself, and then you get everything unmapped and a reordering of your of your program in the libraries, and the heap is gone. So you, you start with a new random layout, and the attacker cannot learn from the previous attack. We made some API changes to make all that possible. So strul copy, strul cut is very old. It's much easier to, to, to use and to get your memory management correctly. We realloc array. Um, when you do malloc, you usually do a multiply. You have the size of the object, and you have the, um, the number of objects, and you multiply that, and you get an integer overflow. And then the attacker, then the, the amount of memory that was allocated and the amount of your memory the program is, is running with is, is differently. And there you have a, a common security attack. In the realloc array, you pass them separately and like calloc. And we check in the library that you don't have an interflow, uh, integer overflow there. Explicit B0 is to remove your, your crypto keys. Free 0 does that when you call free from malloc. It also explicitly B0 is it. Malloc conceals, use the mmap conceal um, flag to make sure that it's not written to a core dump. And in printf, we remove the percent %n option where you can modify um, memory while you try to print it, which is a miss feature. And I think we had some, some GNU stuff in there and we just removed it from there. Some old object dump, whatever, read elf, bin utils. File descriptors, it's very bad to run out of file descriptors, so our daemons like RelayD check with uh, get descriptor table count, how many file descriptors do we have open. It's a new system called specific to OpenBSD. Um, and don't open too many file descriptors. You should have 10 left or so for a DNS request or for some, previously for some logging. Logging was also fixed by using census log. There, you don't need a file descriptor, so by running out of file descriptors, you can still log, because you log directly with a system call to the kernel. And with socket, you can mark something that's used for DNS, and that's important for pledge, so you can allow DNS, but not uh, some other socket or things. So everything has downsides, and the downside is by our porters because they have to get all the stuff running, although the kernel makes it very hard to run programs. So the, the current pain is BTI and IBT, because then the, the program just fails randomly and you have to figure out why some Rust Ruby Go code has some problems because of something. X only was also a hassle, um, because some programs just didn't do it at all. You have assembly where you have um, data within your executable. And now you have to split it. The, the executable is here and data is there and you have to, to go through your OpenSSL binary super, super optimization. Map stack, some people had some, some um, signal stacks or some other stacks or some configure script that set up a stack that, that you have to fix, write or, ex or execute was, was also difficult. And auto malloc also, when I do port some program to OpenBSD, I find new bugs because our malloc is more strict. The important thing about our security features is that we turn them on by default, and you cannot turn it on, uh, off. Um, so we control the kernel with libc and base. There, it's quite easy. We adapt the ports. There, we learn if our security measures are good or, or adequate to run the vast majority of, of the programs for Unix systems, or if it's, if it's too strict or not doable, or the, the, the ecosystem is not ready for it. And as a last resort, we can um, change things to, to, to say, okay, now we need some exceptions. For example, we have this VX allow features where you can say, okay, this one needs uh, execution and write in parallel. For example, that's Python. When you load Python objects, for some reasons I don't understand, it's not possible to make them um, execute uh, or X or writable. So Python in OpenBSD has this flag and it works. And But there are some things that you cannot enable in OpenBSD that's executable stack. 
and this uh, BTI and IBT functions, if the CPU supports it, we, we enforce it. Um, in, in Linux, it's differently. There you, th the loader sees, oh, there's some program that does not support these features, so let's turn it off. So everything runs, but you have to be lucky to do it that it runs securely. So what does it mean um, to have those policy? For example, there was this uh, exploit in the SSA agent. There you use DL open to load four libraries, and DL open executes the, um, the constructors. So when you load a library, it's already executing code. <coughs> and in Linux, you can say in your ELF header, okay, I want executable stack. You should load, load one library that says does and unload it again. Then you found another library that you loaded that sets a signal handler, and then you unload it again. Then you load something else that has the flag no delete, so it's loaded but not unloaded, and the code that you get is loaded there where the, you, uh, the signal handler for the previous library was. Then there's another library in, in the Linux system that immediately crashes. So you jump with the signal handler from the second library to the code of the third library, and because of the first library, you have no executable stack and make your exploit. Why doesn't it go in OpenBSD? Because we do not allow executable stacks at all, no matter what the, the header file says. So it's important to enforce it. So there are sti th still things to do. ARM has some, some part authentication. We still have to implement that. There are shadow stacks. I think there's not much hardware available at the moment. And the next thing, there's a syscall, syscall, where you can en call any system call, and Theo wants to remove that in the next release. And we already changed our Perl so that it will work without it. So what's the main points? So the, 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 the thing comes from the combination. So for every mitigation, you have a, a way to work around it. But then you run into the next mitigation. We, we make a compromise between cheap and effective. We also want to run programs. For example, at Genua, um, we, we use a lot of Perl, and this Perl, we don't use auto-malloc. Perl provides its own implementation of a brk based malloc. It's not that secure, but otherwise our Perl got very slow because it makes a lot of small allocations for every variable in Perl. It makes an, an, an alloc and, and free. And we thought, okay, it's Perl, it's, it's the Perl interpreter itself, we take the risk, but we need the, 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 the performance. So we, 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 everything you can evaluate, does it work for me or what does it not for work for me? But you get a, a, a secure default, you can also say, okay, I want more security and change your malloc options to be something more paranoid. And the, the, the real hard things you cannot turn off, it's always on. And we have the port system as our baseline. So if we can manage to get our ports running, we know that we have found the compromise we want between usability and security. And now we come to the question section, if you have some time. Ah, yeah, okay, Mark. And final part, can you give us a prompt to give this implementation? I leave you with this big idea, but what do you think can be implemented? Like, as soon as you get the program, you will be able to use the implementation themselves to explain to you and things like that. Will you, when somebody programs a star in this sense, also will work much simpler to work with? Like, you want to have something Thank you. 
Mm, pledge has been designed very well because Theo has a very strong opinion of it. So it follows a design principle or his design principle very strictly. And if you want to change something in pledge, there's a lot of arguing. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the secure thing is to do privilege separation like we have in, in um, TCP dump, but having it for TAR is, is n of course, a performance hustle. Okay, we, I think we are over. <laughs>